of 1967 and why it's important as far as the Bible is concerned. The actual date of itself doesn't particularly affect us. I can see looking around the room that there are some who think that 1967 would probably be the sort of thing you do at school as history. And yet there are some of us in the room who remember the date. But whether it's 1967 or 1867 doesn't actually make any difference. It's what happened on those days which is important for us uh, and uh, what is important as far as the Bible is concerned. So, would you turn with me please to Genesis and chapter 15. Promises were made to a faithful man called Abraham, recorded in, in different forms in a number of places in Genesis. We're just going to pick on one of them, which is Genesis 15 and in verse 18. So this is the God of heaven speaking to this faithful man, Abram. And he, we read then, in, in the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So the area of land, which we've noted very approximately between those two red lines, was, was promised way back in the book of Genesis to this man called uh, Abram, and particularly in verse, verse 18, it wasn't Abram to whom it was promised, it was his seed we read of in, in, in chapter 15. So the seed of Abram that we now know as the nation of Israel or, or the Jewish people were promised that land. Now would you come with me please to Hebrews in chapter 11. Because we find there, although Abram and his seed were promised the land, certainly as far as Abram, Isaac and Jacob were concerned, that land, they, they never received it. And in Hebrews and, and chapter 11, and in verse 13, we read there that these all died in faith. And if you look back at the earlier verses, you'll see that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are, are mentioned. These died in faith, not having received the promises. Well, they received the promises in the sense that God made a promise to them. But they didn't receive the promise in the sense that those promises were fulfilled. In other words, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob did not ha have this land uh, that, that was promised to them. And so we must look to a more distant fulfilment of those promises. But these people, these faithful people of old, we, we see in the middle of verse 13, having seen them afar off, so they knew they were going to be fulfilled at a distant time. They saw them afar off but were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And a little earlier in the chapter we see that they, they dwelt in tents. They didn't build cities as many of the other people did in their time. They were as strangers in the land, the land that wasn't theirs. And so... To, to jump uh, a long time in, in history, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob became the nation that we now know as Israel. They went into Egypt as a fairly large family and stayed there for some time and became a nation. They came out of the land of Egypt at the time the Bible calls the Exodus. And they travelled into the land, which is now known as Israel, and they became or established there uh, a kingdom. But at no point really were they a faithful nation. There were some very faithful individuals, but they weren't a faithful nation. And eventually, although God had promised that land to Abram and his seed they were to be taken off the land because they were faithless would you come with me then to 
2nd of Kings and chapter 18. And what the, the map displays is that the northern part of the land of Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And in 2nd of Kings and chapter 18, we have what the Bible has to say. 2nd of Kings and chapter 18. And we read there in verse 9. It came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Israel and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it. Even the sixth year of Hezekiah, which is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel into Assyria and put them in Halar, and in Habor, by the river Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. So we're told there what, what happened, that the Assyrians came, besieged the, the towns, took them away, the, the, the Israel, Israelites away. But then we're told in verse 12 why. Because they obeyed not the voice of Yahweh their God, but transgressed his covenant, and all that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded, and would not hear them, nor do them. So they quite deliberately turned away from, from the law that God had given to them through Moses. And they served other gods. And eventually, after sending uh, many prophets to the people, God had had enough and took them away at the hand of the Assyrians into the Assyrian Empire. But that's just the northern kingdom. If you'd come to, whoops, wrong way, 2nd of Kings 25, we find the same thing happened to the southern part of the kingdom called Judah. <coughs> and in 2nd of Kings 25, we read that uh, it came to pass in the ninth year of, of his reign, the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host against Jerusalem, pitched against it, built forts against it round about. The city was besieged to the eleventh year of Zedekiah. And then you can read the rest of the chapter and you can see that the southern part of the kingdom, Judah and Jerusalem, were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And so there are very few Israelites left in the land. But in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, some of them went back, and fairly obviously at the time of Christ, there were a good number of Jews back in the land. But it wasn't to last long. Come with me to Deuteronomy and chapter 28. Although we're going right back into the law of Moses and the things that Moses said just before the children of Israel went into the land chapter 28 is an amazing prophecy of what was to happen to them and I just want to pick up in particular verse 63 and onwards and we read there in verse 63 of Deuteronomy 28 it shall come to pass that if Yahweh hath rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so Yahweh will rejoice over you, to destroy you, to bring you to naught, that you should be plucked from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Remember, they hadn't got there yet. They were still on their way. And so even before they got there, they were being told that they were going to be taken off the land. And then in verse 64, Yahweh will scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth to the other. Uh, and in effect... That's a small portion of a fulfilment of that verse that we can see uh, on the map behind us. Obviously, uh, that has been scattered there to the areas around the Mediterranean. But they went much further abroad than that. But nevertheless, it, it's a simple way of, of explaining that that's where the Jews went in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, after the time when the Romans uh, took Jerusalem, took the whole land, and it, uh, it was besieged in, in uh, AD 70, but the whole land was, it was eventually taken in AD 135. An Emperor Hadrian decreed 
uh, that there should be no Jews living in Jerusalem. And so all appears to be lost, and we might ask the question, well, we've seen the promises that were made to Abraham, just briefly. Well, are, are they abandoned? Are, are they worthless? And we shall see that the answer is no. But what of the land then? The land that was, for all practical purposes, emptied of the Jews by the Romans and lay empty for centuries. Eventually, the, uh, the Turks took it in 1512, but the Turks weren't interested in developing the land. It, it was just left to rot almost. Uh, they weren't interested in, in agriculture. Uh, they just wanted the land, and as you can see, it's all just a small part of a much bigger empire. And they certainly weren't interested in bringing the Jews back into the land. That wasn't part of their plan at all. And so we ask the question again, of what value then is, is there, are these promises? And we shall see that they are of great value. So that's taken us to the 16th century. I want to take another leap forward now, a bit closer to our own times, and what's become known as the Balfour Declaration. And the first part of that, or part of it says... His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine, a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavours to facilitate that this was going to happen. So the land had become known as Palestine, although some of us, many of us now know it as Israel. That isn't what the Arabs want to call it, of course. Um, they still refer to it as Palestine. But there is the document that, that set in, in, in pace a, a, a number of events whereby the British government wanted to establish a homeland for the Jews in the land of Israel. Other places had been suggested, some in Africa, for example, but the Jews weren't interested in those places. They knew that their homeland was the land that was promised to the fathers of old, and it was in the land that we now know as Israel. Well, the Balfour Declaration was written in November of 1917. November 1917. And in December of 1917, General Allenby walked into Jerusalem, having relieved the Turks of Jerusalem and thereby putting it in British hands. As far as the Jews were concerned, of course... That was perhaps marginally better than being in Arab hands, but it still wasn't in Jewish hands. However, it was a significant event. And you can see from the newspapers of the day, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, Jerusalem is rescued by the British after 673 years of Muslim rule. That doesn't quite tie up with the 1512, but nevertheless. Um, that was the headline at, at the time. Uh, and there's General Allenby... Uh, proudly presented on the front page of that newspaper. But just notice the language, rescued, as it say, British, rescued by the British, um, obviously realising that uh, it wasn't good that it should be in Arab hands. Uh, but anyway, um, and you can see from the headline of what was then the Daily Sketch, the holy city in British hands. And at the top of the page, Allenby enters Jerusalem today. So it was a, a significant event and remember, that was in 1917. And so what the First World War did, amongst other things, was to drive the Arabs out of the land of Israel. But there were then remarkably few Jews in the land of Israel. That had to wait until the Second World War, when Jews, principally of Europe and Russia, uh, had such an appalling time that they were only too glad to go into the land of Israel. Meanwhile, the United Nations is debating this issue of where the Jews should go. And UN Resolution 181 came up with a partition plan. In other words, that the yellow bits were to be an Arab state, 
and that the orange or brown bits would be a Jewish state. And to the world in general, that no doubt seemed a reasonable compromise. That wasn't how the Jews saw it, however, because the promises that had been made to them by not only the God of heaven, but the creator of the heaven and the earth, he who can dispense with the earth and how he sees fit, said that that land was to be theirs, the Jews, not the Arabs. And so it was never going to be, or there something than the halfway house. But that was in 1947. In 1948, the State of Israel was established. And you can see there the State of Israel is born in the headlines. But you can then see some small print, which you probably can't read. And then underneath that, just notice that little headline, Egyptian Air Force Spitfires bomb Tel Aviv, one shot down. On the very day that the nation was established, they were under attack by the Egyptian Air Force. We might ask where they got the Spitfires from. But nevertheless, they were under attack uh, on the very day that they established themselves as a nation. Well, once the, as the nation was established and the atrocities of the Second World War would been, had been taking place, that meant that Jews had somewhere to go. They had somewhere where they didn't want to be, which was Europe. They had somewhere where they wanted to be, which was the land of Israel. And so they went in, in, in their thousands. And, sorry, gone too far, a couple of pictures of the, the, the transport that they went in, even uh, those pictures, they don't look particularly seaworthy boats, do they? Um, but, but just have a, a look, if you can make it out, on that banner in the middle picture. It says, the Germans destroyed our, our uh, destroyed our families and our homes. Don't you destroy our hope. Now that was intended to be read by the people on the shore and the people in control on the shore were the British. And so the Jews recognised that although they were going in their, their thousands back into the land of Israel, they didn't necessarily get a welcome. Uh, and that is true, isn't it? Certain of the ships were, were turned away. And so there's that really heart-wrenching banner. Germans destroyed our homes and our families, don't you destroy our hopes. But the Jews were allowed to settle. And there's a picture of an early settlement. So they'd come from, from Europe, and many of them, of course, were very wealthy. Many of them, well, they were businessmen and, and traders, and, and they, as the Jews have always been, very successful. But they'd had all that taken away from them by the, the, uh, the Nazis. And so they were only too glad to get to the land of Israel, even though they had nothing, possibly just the clothes they stood up in. But then what were they to do? They had to survive. So from being businessmen and traders and scientists and all that kind of thing, they had to become farmers. Put yourself in that position. You've gone to a foreign land, albeit your homeland, that you would regard it as such. You've turned up from, from a rusty old boat and you've turned up into the land. You've been given a place in a tent. And then you've got to make your own living from the land. And that was what they had to do. And they moved from there, often many of them to kibbutz, where they would learn how to farm the land in what were effectively com uh, communes. So that was the case as the Jews went into the land. And those were the reception centres, those were the kind of people, and they had to get on with, with what was really very pressing matter of getting their own food ready. Now I find, I find this remarkable. Just 17 years later, Israel was attacked on all sides. And we've come now to 1967. 
So from a people who had nothing, a people who had to concentrate on farming, 17 years later, not only were they attacked on all sides, but their response was astonishing. On the left-hand side, you can see a, a picture of uh, an Egyptian aircraft, and it's fairly well documented that the Egyptian air force was destroyed on the ground before it got into the air. The Jews were aware of what was going on and destroyed the air force on the ground. The tanks were set to roll across the Sinai Desert and the tanks were similarly destroyed in fairly short order. Short order being six days. They were attacked on all sides and even while the Egyptian forces were being destroyed President Nasser was, was saying things to his uh, uh, Arab counterparts that surrounded uh, Israel in effect come on come and join in we can destroy them whereas the truth of the matter was it was the Egyptians that were being destroyed certainly to the, to the south and the west of the land of Israel and so as inevitably happens with war boundaries change and those three maps are, are really quite interesting if you look at them one at a time over on the left hand side is another representation of what the United Nations wanted to happen not that it ever did in the middle is the, the, a map of the boundaries in 1949 in other words, the boundaries that the Jews established for themselves, completely irrespective of what the UN had to say, those were the boundaries that, uh, that they took at that time. Then over on the right-hand side is the consequence of the Six Days' War. And what is particularly interesting, it, there are the two areas, or three areas of interest on the, on the map. Up in the north is the Golan Heights, and the Golden Heights are still in Israeli possession. And the reason that the Syrians don't like that in particular is because from the Golden Heights you can see straight into Damascus. And what's more, you can fire your uh, rockets into Damascus from the Golden Heights. So whoever possesses the Golden Heights uh, is in control of that part of the land. And then in the middle we can see what the world knows as the West Bank, which is to the west of the river Jerusalem, so it's on the west bank of the of sorry, the river Jordan. It's on the west bank of the river Jordan and included Jerusalem. Further south we can see the Sinai Peninsula. And although the Jews took the Sinai Peninsula, uh, they actually handed it back to the Egyptians in a, a, a peace deal. So the area then that's of particular interest to us is the West Bank and Jerusalem. And first of all, then, we want to consider the West Bank. The world knows that area, that, that's, um, that pale brown there, as the West Bank. The Bible doesn't call it the West Bank. The Bible calls it the mountains of Israel. And there are one or two places there where we can see that um, the mountains of Israel are mentioned. But I particularly want to look at um, Ezekiel 38. Can we go there? It was a passage that we read. Ezekiel 38 is a chapter which I'm sure is, is mentioned from this platform from time to time. So we're not going to look at a great deal of detail other than to say in verse 2 an individual is mentioned called Gog. And we've reason to believe that Gog is whoever is in control at the time in the land of Russia. Other nations are mentioned but it's not our purpose this evening to go through those nations. We just want to mention that uh, at the end of verse 6 we see, and many peoples with thee. So almost regardless of the nations that are actually mentioned, we know there are lots more besides. So it's an international army that is going to come down into the land of Israel, and that hasn't yet happened. So we're now at the time where the Jews have taken the land and 
particularly that have taken the West Bank or the mountains of Israel. Now just come with me please. We've just glanced at verse 6 of the many people with thee. And then we read in verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited, and in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. There's an awful lot of detail in these verses that is truly remarkable. First of all, we look at that phrase, the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel are immediately to the west of the River Jordan. And as we said, are known in the world as the West Bank. So if we were to put that in today's language, then Russia is going to come down onto the West Bank. But just look at what else we read. Now, although it's addressed to a land, it clearly means the people. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. So it has been warfare. Gathered out of many people. Well, Israel have been scattered to the four corners of the earth and they've been brought back and we can see today that there are there are many Jews in the land of Israel that have come from all over the world and that process is going to continue the mountains of Israel which have been always waste and really from the time that the Jews were taken off the land in, in AD 70 and then 135 it was waste until the Jews went back in the land until the Jews put their backs into the agriculture of the land and when God blessed them with the rain and the bringing forth of the produce of the land. So these people that have been brought out of the nation, so Israel gathered from all over the place into the land, a remarkable detail. And then they come like a storm. And in verse 16... We read there, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So the people of Israel must be in the West Bank because it's the same invasion. So the people of Israel have to be in possession of the mountains of Israel before this prophecy can be fulfilled. And that took place in 1967. So before 1967, this prophecy couldn't possibly have been fulfilled. But obviously, since that time, it could have been fulfilled and could be fulfilled at any time. The mountains of Israel. We can see that it's a, a beautiful place. It's a land which will be overrun with armies. And yet it will eventually become a land of peace. Also on the, the West Bank, you can see there the River Jordan, you can see what the world has come to know as settlements. It's where the Israelis and, and certain individuals, groups, uh, were very keen to establish the land to be theirs that was promised to their fathers. And from a scriptural point of view, they are absolutely right to do so. From the world's point of view, they're simply grabbing land off the Arabs, uh, which shouldn't be theirs anyway because they got it by war. It should really belong to the Arabs because of the United Nations partition plan. Um, but that, of course, isn't how the Jews see it. As far as the Bible is concerned, the people of Israel should be in the mountains of Israel. It was the land that God promised to them. And if the world doesn't like it, well, that's just too bad for them. So it's not just the West Bank then that was taken in 1967. We come now to the city of Jerusalem itself. And some interesting characters in these, these pictures. Um, we understand this wasn't the, the actual taking of Jerusalem. This was a photo opportunity that was taken some time later. But nevertheless, look at those three individuals on, in the centre picture. No, the, sorry, the right-hand side there. IDF Commander Narkis. Defence Minister Moshe Dayan and Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin. 
And the latter two, uh, from time to time, have been uh, prime ministers of Israel. So these were the men that masterminded the taking of the West Bank and Jerusalem and indeed the Sinai Peninsula. From a human point of view, we would have to emphasise that all of this is in God's hands. And if he determined that his people of Israel would take that land that he promised, then it is he that is in control. But humanly speaking, these were the men who masterminded it all. So when you think of the various deals that have been on offer from various American presidents, uh, various sort of land for peace and giving part of the land back to the Arabs, when these people were the prime ministers, it was never, ever going to happen. They had fought for that land, and they weren't ever going to give it back. So Jerusalem then, that, that city which is so often in controversy, it's, it's a millstone around the neck of many people who have tried to take it. Uh, and it's the centre of, it is said, uh, well, it is, of, of three world religions. But it is the God of Israel that will establish his people with their religion and everything else will go. When the earthquake comes, um, the, uh, those mosques and, and whatever, they're going to be flattened. We didn't worry about them. So, come with me please to Zechariah in chapter 12. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 12, and there's a, a phrase that recurs in Zechariah 12, it's in that day. It doesn't mean literally a 24-hour day, you can put a ring around on the calendar. It, it's a series of related events that happen at an approximately similar time. And it's all about setting up the kingdom when Christ returns and he will set up the kingdom. And in verse 7 we read there that Yahweh will save the tents of Judah first. And Judah is the people that are in the land of Israel that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify against Judah. Uh, in that day, Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that he that is feeble among them in the day uh, shall be as David. So there will come a time when Jerusalem is, uh, and Judah is going to be attacked, and it's exactly the same as we saw in Ezekiel 38. Israel is going to come down. In, no, Russia and the international army is going to come down into the land of Israel... <coughs> And there will be a time when it appears that all is lost. These verses say that God is going to fight for his people. And it doesn't matter how big the international army is, it doesn't matter how well armed they are, they will be destroyed because God has decreed it in Zechariah 12. Joel and chapter 3. Let's have a look at Joel and chapter 3. <clears throat> Joel and chapter 3 and in the first couple of verses of Joel and chapter 3 we read there uh, that behold in these days and that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem and bring again means to release it doesn't mean they brought captive again I will gather all nations that multinational army that we saw in Ezekiel 38. All nations will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is by Jerusalem. And I will plead, and that doesn't mean ask, it means judge. I will judge them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So the whole lot of historical reasons. But then, because they have attacked Israel, God is going to fight for his people. And in verse 14, we read, multitudes, multitudes, it's this large army that's going to come down into the land. In the valley of, we read, in, if you've got an AV, it'll say decision. If you've got a margin, it may well say concision. It, it, it means threshing. And so, uh, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars shall withdraw their light, and Yahweh will roar his voice out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. 
and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Yahweh will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And, and so God is going to fight for his people. So there's another passage there that says that multitudes and multitudes in the valley really would be better rendered the valley of threshing. And we're not going to go there, but Revelation 16 <coughs> describes the battle of Armageddon, which is a heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment. They're going to be threshed, and that's exactly what Joel is describing. But none of these things could take place until the Jews had taken the West Bank and the Jews had taken Jerusalem. And that all happened in 1967. So, why then was 1967 important? We just said it gave Israel two key things as far as prophecy is concerned. The West Bank or the mountains of Israel and Jerusalem. And so until these prophecies could be fulfilled, it could not be the case that Christ could return because Christ returns at that crisis as far as the world is concerned. But these armies can now come down into the land of Israel. Therefore Christ can come. He can establish the kingdom. He can take the land away from this international army and, and can establish again the Jewish people in the Jewish homeland that was promised to the fathers. And so what we have then is the fact that the scene is set. So what happens next then is the return of Christ to establish God's kingdom upon this earth. And how we, we hope and we pray that that day will indeed soon come. And we hope and pray that we can be with him in that victorious time.